Hi, how are you? I'm Emily Barnum. I'm one of the guidance counselors, the director of the department. Um, thanks so much for coming. This is the first time we've had some educational group come to Swampscott High School, and so I'm excited tonight to introduce Dr. Heilpern. Um, he goes by Drew. Apparently, I'm the only one besides his mother who calls him doctor. Um, but he has an extremely decorated past and um, very interesting and diverse history and arrival of getting here to Swampscott High School. So um, after graduating with a dual degree in education and biology from Duke University, um, moved on to a, a doctoral program at Tufts University, um, figuring out that he was really interested in genetics. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. um, in genetics and completed his postdoc fellowship in Lyme disease. So um, we are promised an update on the state of Lyme disease <laughs> at the end of the presentation, if you stay that long. Um, and um, in during all of those experiences in both biology and education, found some time to teach middle school science. And then after meeting his wife, kind of decided that um, working at some educational group in a tutoring capacity capacity made a lot of sense and he's kind of continued to do that as he's um, you know had a family and the whole thing so thank you so much for coming I hope Emily, I didn't totally you. butcher your past um, feel free to correct me I won't be embarrassed <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming tonight's presentation is about um, one of the major pieces of academic information that goes into the college application so that is standardized testing standardized testing among um, other elements is just one element of the college application and process. And I think Drew is going to do an excellent job at reiterating much of what we you know, talk about already and what we'll begin to talk to the juniors about um, more intensely as we talk in the junior seminars. And then we'll see you guys again at the end of January for junior parent night. But we'll kind of give you the lay of the land in terms of admissions testing, mostly the SAT and the ACT. And we'll cover a little bit about the PSAT um, and, and touch on subject tests a little bit. However, we'll also discuss with you important timelines, what to worry about, and honestly, what not to worry about. I heard um, one of the parents come in and, and mention that um, she had a sophomore, and is that too early? It's certainly not too early to be listening. I think the more information you have, the better off you'll be in terms of making decisions for um, your sons or daughters and um, developing an appropriate plan for, for him or her. And I think, like everything else that we talk about, this process is highly individualized, so you, know, you wanna make sure that you're developing a plan that's right for, for your child. And, and I know Drew, um, Dr. Hyoplern, will also um, emphasize that message. So thank you again for coming. And without further ado, Drew. Emily, thank you. So thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, a couple goals. Probably my biggest goal is just to try to put these tests in context. You'll hear me come back to this point. But they are not the be all end all of the college application process. So to quote the late great Chris Farley of Saturday Night Live fame, your sons and daughters are not gonna be living in vans down by a river according to their SAT or ACT scores. So for students who came, thanks for coming tonight. I'm sure there were a million other places you would rather be. Uh, but if you have no understanding of what that reference was, just go on to YouTube and just put in living in a van down by a river, and you'll see sort of the skit that I am referring to there. The other goal, as Emily said, uh, in addition to trying to put these tests into context, just uh, most of our talk is just going to be focusing on that SAT and ACT and doing a deeper dive so you have a better understanding of what those tests look like. They are very different tests than kind of the tests we took and what, um, what we were exposed to when we went through this. And then, as Emily mentioned, we'll just talk a little bit about subject tests. I won't do a huge dive on that. Talk about test planning, and then we'll end just on score choice and score. Uh, and super scoring, just for those of you new to this, just to make sure that you have an understanding of what those terms uh, mean. Just real quickly, logistically, before we dive in, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you in a relatively short amount of time. Please do not feel like you have to hang on my every word. Obviously, I'll feel flattered if you do. But everything we're going to cover tonight is in our college admission testing guide. I've also uh, printed out the presentation. So if you want to take notes or follow along or know your presentation future, uh, you can consult the, the printout on that. And then lastly, the other thing that I put in, just so you're aware, we do offer free proctored practice tests uh, in various areas. So I put in the schedule uh, for those that were running on the North Shore in Andover and in Peabody. 
And then we also run them in Newton. We run them on weekends, so hopefully traffic's not too bad on a Saturday or Sunday. But if you're interested or your students are interested in trying a full-length um, proctored practice test, it's totally free. Definitely um, call us up and take advantage um, of those. And then just one other quick logistical thing. I'm just going to ask everybody, if you can, just to try to hold questions to the end, just in the interest of time. I'm going to talk hopefully for about 50, 55 minutes, and I definitely want to leave time for questions um, at the end. Um, so with that, before we dive in, just by a quick show of hands, so this is for parents and guardians, how many of you have gone through the college admission process before with an older son or daughter? OK, how many of you have not? OK, almost all of you. So the one homework assignment coming out of here, and I'm going to ask this question one more time. For those of you going through this uh, for the first time, one trait that's helpful in this process is having a little bit of courage. So I'll ask it one more time. So for those of you going through it for the first time, and students, obviously, you can raise your hand. And as I'm talking, you have to keep it up. So those of you going through this for the first time, keep your hands up. OK, so the one homework assignment coming out of here for the two of you who have gone through this before is you have to find someone with their hand up at the end of this presentation and reassure them that everything is going to be fine because everything does end up fine. OK, and with that, I'll just dive in. So I start with this slide. This, I start here because this is probably the number one question that I get at this presentation. And that question goes something like this. Drew, we're in a pretty competitive environment here in the Northeast. Uh, can my son or daughter really get into his or her top school choice uh, by just submitting an ACT score? And for those of you totally new to this, the two major tests that colleges are looking at is either the SAT or the ACT. You have to think about this in terms of Coke versus Pepsi. Uh, it is a market share battle between these two organizations. They are two totally separate organizations and two totally separate tests. But to answer that hypothetical question, the answer to that is students absolutely can get into their top school choice um, by just submitting an ACT um, score. Colleges accept them equally. They do not have a preference for one test or the other. They do not see one test as a better test or a superior test and one test as an inferior test. And I might see one hand go up. I'm actually expecting no hands to go up to this question. Any of you parents or guardians in the room, did any of you take the ACT as your college admission test? OK, I have three hands that went up. So now I get to guess where you are from. So any of you, of the three of you, any of you from Illinois, Ohio, or Michigan? And I totally, oh, yay, I got one hand going up for Michigan. So the reason why I'm guessing um, Midwest um, states it's not that I'm psychic. It's not that we planted this before this uh, presentation. Just historically speaking, SAT is always considered, it's always been more of an East Coast, West Coast test, whereas the ACT always been more of a Midwest test. But that landscape's totally changing. More and more of our students here in the Northeast are taking that ACT, and more and more students in the Midwest are actually going down an SAT path or choosing to take that SAT. And you can see, nationally speaking, Actually, last year, more students uh, took the ACT than took the SAT. Again, both are accepted equally. And again, back to that idea of it just being a test. It's not the be all, end all of the college admission uh, process. So what you're looking at here, this is a survey done by NACAC. So NACAC's the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. They do this survey every year, and they reach out to college admission folk. And what they're asking is just year in and year out, they're asking colleges to give them a sense in terms of all these various criteria that they're looking at in terms of ranking them um, in their either ranking it with considerable or moderate importance. And they do this survey year after year. And the number one answer that colleges always come back with, the most important thing that they're looking at is a student's transcript, a student's grades in their courses, their day in and day out uh, academic work that they're doing in school. The next thing that they look at is that strength of curriculum. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as rigor. Are students challenging themselves? Are they taking advantage of the opportunities presented to them? And then, depending on the college, um, that third or fourth, depending on how you do the math, uh, criteria that they're looking at is standardized uh, testing. So again, it's just a piece. It's not the be all, end all. So we don't want to give it more life uh, than these tests deserve. But on the other hand, too, we don't want to completely put our, our head in the sand on this. There are colleges out there that are going to put weight on those scores. Uh, so it is helpful just to kind of have some information about that standardized testing landscape piece. But those colleges that are getting, for instance, 30 
30 to 40,000 applications. They are reading the counselor recommendations and teacher recommendations. They are reading the essays. They are looking at the extracurricular activities and position of leadership or any employment that the students done uh, for every single applicant. And all of that is weighed into that final decision. And for the, again, for those of you new to this, the term that you'll hear around this is holistic review. So what they're trying to do with that holistic review is they're trying to get to know the students as a, or the applicant as a person, not just as a number. So even for those large state schools that are getting, again, 40,000 plus applications, it's not like they're taking the GPA and the standardized testing scores, putting it in some kind of algorithm and formula, getting a number, and then making that admissions decision based on that number. All of these factors are going to be weighed into that final uh, decision. And just so you're aware of this, there is a recent trend now that more and more schools are going test optional. So the test optional schools, what that means is students are in complete control of their test scores. It's up to them to decide whether or not they're going to submit those scores to those colleges. And it's an increasingly competitive list of schools that are going test optional. It's not just kind of more rural schools or smaller schools that never really show up on students' lists. And I'll just point out too here, University of Chicago, um, just went test optional. They went test optional over the summer. A lot of publicity around uh, them going test optional. And then another one that also recently went test optional within the last couple of weeks actually is Colby College, uh, another school that's gone test optional. And the thing with the admissions folk is they're not playing gotcha on this. Uh, for those uh, colleges that are test optional, when you ask college admission folk from these universities or colleges in terms of why they've gone test optional, what they'll tell you is they'll tell you that something along these lines of, Drew, just we know for a certain population of students, there's going to be students out there where those standardized testing scores, they're, just, they're not reflective of who that student is and what that student is capable of. And at these test optional schools, essentially what they're saying is, we'd rather not see those scores. We don't need to see those scores in order to be able to evaluate the strength of that applicant, in order to be able to sort of predict how well they would do on our campus. And again, they're not playing gotcha here. So if you apply to a test optional school, it's not like they're going to uh, look at that student's application and be like, all right, you know, they're applying from Swampskit, right? They probably took these tests. They're not sending them. Therefore, the scores must be horrible. So we're not going to accept that student. For these test optional schools, again, it's not any kind of red flag. It doesn't put them behind the eight ball if they choose not to submit scores. Those uh, college admission folk are purely going um, to are purely going to make that decision based on all those kind of other factors that we saw in that previous slide. Just a couple caveats to the test optional movement, just so you're aware of it. One is if your student is uh, an athlete and potentially going to be recruited and potentially going to be looking at especially like Division three schools or NESCAC schools, you can see there's a number of them on there. Connecticut College is one. Even though those schools admit test optionally for their population of students, for the recruited athlete, those coaches are going to need scores and are going to ask for scores from that, from that student. And we don't have time to get into this, but if you have questions, certainly at the end you can ask me. But that's just about, it's, it has to do with the whole academic index for recruited athletes and standardized testing scores are part of that academic index score. So just keep that in mind. If you're looking at especially some of the Nestegat schools as a recruited athlete, even though, again, they admit test optionally for the recruited athlete, uh, they're going to want standardized testing scores. The other thing just to be aware of, and this, this statistic isn't going to surprise you, um, but generally, usually it's between or it's over 50%, if not over 60% of students who are applying to these test optional schools end up sending scores. And again, that's not uh, that surprising, knowing that it is, a, it is a smaller population of students whose scores really end up being not sort of reflective on that. And then the third uh, just sort of caveat to test optional, I just want to make you aware of this, is not to kind of depress all of us with the skyrocketing cost of tuition, but one way in which colleges are trying to make um, college more affordable and that tuition more affordable for families is through uh, granting merit aid scholarships. And generally speaking, merit aid, it's non-need based financial aid. But some of these schools that admit test optionally, when they give these merit aid awards, they do consider standardized testing scores uh, as part of those awards. And again, I don't 
put this up to kind of ratchet up the pressure around standardized testing to be like, oh my gosh, like we got to get a 32 or a 33 or a 1450 on the SAT so you know we can maximize the amount of money that we potentially get. It's more just as you're putting your college list together, just be aware, especially if you're if you're willing to expand the list a little bit and look at schools outside of New England. There are a lot of colleges out there who just who love getting our students. They just they know how prepared our students are and just how um, intellectually curious they are. And in order to kind of recruit our students, one way in which they do it is they start they start throwing money. And depending on the college and the caliber of the student, as you can see, they can throw some pretty significant money at students. So that's why I just want to put Merit Aid just on your radar, just something to think about that more and more colleges are offering Merit Aid. <laughs> And more and more colleges um, are, um, depending on the college, are kind of tying it to standardized testing scores. Which then kind of brings me to this question, which always goes something like this, which is like, all right, Drew, so it's 2019 now, right? We know that um, standardized tests not the be-all, end-all of the college admission process. More and more colleges are going test optional. More and more competitive colleges are going test optional and are saying, look, we don't actually need to see standardized testing scores in order to be able to evaluate an applicant. So why am I up here tonight? Why are all of you here tonight? Why are we still talking about standardized testing scores and looking at that infamous bell curve? So there's a couple pressures at play that are preserving standardized testing. Probably the number one pressure that's preserving them is just sort of the sheer number of students that are currently applying uh, to colleges. So increasingly, college admissions officers, they're faced with applicants both internationally and also domestically, where they just, they might not have any experience um, from, from, from applicants from that school. So they may not have accepted anyone from that school. They may not have even seen an application from anyone at that school. And even for those applicants, still going to be holistic review, still going um, to still going to consider all those other factors. But the standardized testing, it just, it gives them another data point. It gives them an objective data point, an objective perspective in which to evaluate the transcript and maybe some of the recommendations. And for lack of a better term, this is just where coming from Swampskit just kind of gives you a little bit of an advantage. Just colleges, they know the rigor of the curriculum here. They know how well our students are prepared for that next level. So it doesn't mean that for those students or for those colleges that look at or put weight on standardized testing, it doesn't mean that they're not going to look at those scores. But it just it might not carry that same weight or same importance as from another student applying from a school where, again, they just, they've never heard of it or they just don't have any kind of history or context um, with it. And then again, I'm going to hit you with a lot of information in a relatively short amount of time. But if you only remember one slide from this entire presentation, this is the slide that I want you to remember. At the end of the day, helping students hit their full potential on these tests comes down to having a testing plan. And the testing plan is pretty much three pretty straightforward questions. Which test should I take? When should I take them? And then how and when should I prepare uh, for them? The, the testing plan hopefully does a couple things for you. One, hopefully it reduces some of the anxiety around this, just kind of knowing when these tests are happening and when your students are going to take them. And then also, if you have this testing plan, it also hopefully ensures that students aren't going to go in and take that test cold. So you got to keep in mind that these are national tests. So still, the vast majority of students kind of wake up on a Saturday morning, and they're like, oh my gosh, I got the SAT today. They go in, and they take the SAT, and they walk out of there, and they're like, that was horrible, but at least I'm done with this. But if you have that testing plan ahead of time, it just it gives your student a little bit of an advantage. It just ensures that they're going to go in, hopefully not totally cold, to know what to expect, just to enable them to put their best foot forward on this. And Emily already mentioned this, but I just want to piggyback on her uh, comments on this. At the end of the day, that perfect testing plan or right testing plan is what works best for you. There's no right or wrong way to kind of go about this. I'll give you some general guidelines um, that we think about when helping families put a testing plan together. But at the end of the day, that perfect testing plan is going to work is going to be what works best for you as a family and for your student. And please, please, please don't worry or hit the panic button if your testing plan is different than what a neighbor is doing or a best friend is doing or even maybe what an older sibling did. Again, there's many, many, many avenues to success on this. And you'll hear me come back to this point, but I want to make it now. Just keep in mind that performance on these tests, it correlates with age, maturity, and time spent in school. 
So generally speaking, the later students take these tests, the better that they do. So generally, if students are taking it late spring of junior year, fall of senior year, is statistically speaking often when they hit their best score. So I know that there's huge pressures out there for early and often testing, just keep testing, 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 and start earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. But I just encourage you, anything you can do to kind of drown out the noise a little bit. So if you're talking to a family's cousins, neighbors, it's always like nine degrees of separation, and you're hearing, yeah, this family's students uh, started you know, prepping for the ACT in ninth grade. They've already prepped for it for two and a half years. They've already taken it four times, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't even know what an ACT is, let alone having my son or daughter already start preparing for this. Again, I just encourage you, just smile sweetly. Right, do everything you can to not kind of get caught up in that and just kind of be like, yeah, we're going to go in possibly a slightly different direction on that. Because there might be a very, very good reason as to why that family needed to start so early and why, um, and why they started the prep, you know, in what you might argue seems a little bit, um, a little bit premature in terms, of, in terms of that. So again, many, many different paths. Generally speaking, students hit their best scores late spring of junior year, fall of senior year. And then which tests? So uh, we're talking PSAT, really just for practice. Colleges aren't making any admissions decision based on a PSAT score. They're not even seeing that PSAT score. SAT, ACT is going to be the bulk of what we talk about. Subject tests on the way out, but not completely out of the standardized testing uh, landscape just yet. We'll just talk real briefly about those uh, more towards the end. And then AP, a little bit outside the scope of what we're going to have time to cover tonight. So just real quickly on that PSAT. That P, it stands for preliminary. We think of it as being practice. It really is just practice for that SAT. The real benefit of that PSAT comes from anytime students get an opportunity to take an official test under uh, real conditions, especially when it doesn't count, it's always good experience for them and good exposure for them just in terms of a little bit of practice with taking a standardized um, test. But the real benefit of that PSAT, I always try to, um, I always try to recommend to, to students and to families like, don't get hung up on that top line score. The value of the PSAT is really not in the score. Really the value of that PSAT in addition to practice is students are going to get an itemized score report back, which will show them every question they get right and every question they get wrong. They're also going to have access to the test booklet so they can go in and they can see which questions that they missed. So really the value of that PSAT comes from students at a high level having the discipline to go back and go through those questions and look at their answers and get a general sense of their overall strengths and weaknesses. What areas do they need to improve on when, uh, especially as they're heading into late spring of junior year as they start taking these tests for real? Just real quickly on the scoring of this, just so you're uh, familiar with how that PSAT is scored. So that SAT, it's on that 200 to 800 point scale that we all kind of know and love. That PSAT, it's on that 160 to 760 scale. So the question I always get is, all right, Drew, so it's at a 760 instead of 800. So when we get the verbal score back and the math score back from that PSAT, can we just add 40 points to it? And that would be the score that my son or daughter would have gotten had he or she taken an SAT on that day. And you can probably guess from the tone of my voice in the way that I'm talking about that, this, that the answer to that is unfortunately no, you can't. Um, you can kind of see the way the slide is, is set up. I won't get into it in much detail. But all of these tests are what they're called vertically aligned in their scoring. So what that means is a student, for instance, who got 650 math and 650 on the verbal, that is the score um, that he or she would have gotten had she taken an SAT on that day. So you can use that PSAT as that baseline score. Uh, it is the score they would have gotten uh, on that SAT. And the reason why it, that scale is kind of shifted to the left, that 160 to 760, this is the College Board acknowledging that students are taking this test a little bit early. So for juniors, they're taking it in October of junior year. Again, students are most prepared to take this late spring of junior year or fall of senior year. 
So for instance, on the math, in that 760 to 800 point scale range, those hardest math questions that are on the SAT, they're just not on that PSAT. So that's why the curve is cut off at 760. Similarly, there's some easier questions on that PSAT in that 160 to 200 point range uh, that just aren't on that SAT. So that's why you can think of it, College Board always talks about it in terms of being the same scale, but it's just, it's shifted to the left. But the take home message on this, the value of the PSAT, really great in terms of identifying overall strengths and weaknesses, and it will give you a general baseline score in terms of how a student would have done had they taken a, a, an SAT on that day. But again, where they start and where they finish are gonna be two totally different places. So don't hit that panic button if that PSAT score came in a little bit lower than maybe what you were expecting or what you were hoping uh, for. And then just at a high level, this is the 30,000 foot view as we do a deeper dive on the SAT and the ACT and talk about the differences between um, these tests. So at the 30,000 foot view, anytime a standardized test creator writes a standardized test, there's two components that go into the design of that test. The first is aptitude versus curriculum. So aptitude in its purest form, we think of that as being more of an IQ test measuring a student's quote innate ability to learn, whereas curriculum based test, exactly as it sounds, more in line with what students are doing day in and day out in school. The other component that goes into the design of a standardized test is speed versus power. So power speaks to the difficulty of the reading on the test, sort of the trickiness of the questions or complexity of the questions on that test. Whereas speed, exactly as it sounds, the difficulty comes from the pace of it. Can students actually get through the test in the time allotted? And again, not to bring back vicious flashbacks of your own standardized testing experience, but you might remember what I'm calling that old SAT. Very much an aptitude test, very much a power test. A lot of misdirection on that test, a lot of trying to make things seem much harder than they actually were. When I was working with students on that old SAT, spent a lot of time with students, helping them get inside the test taker's head, really understand what that question was asking and when they were 50-50 on a question, understanding what makes a right answer right and a wrong answer wrong. And in the year 2013, College Board started facing some pretty heavy criticism for having a test like that. It just, it felt random to kids and esoteric. It felt totally disconnected from what they were doing in school. So one of the goals of the redesigned SAT that went into effect of March 2016, so we've had it now for over two years, was to make it less of an um, aptitude test and more of a curriculum-based test, so more in line with what students are doing day in and day out in school. It's still the College Board, though. It's still the SAT. It still has what I call SAT-ness to it. So there is still that element of misdirection or that element of power to it, but not to the extent of that SAT that we all knew and love. The ACT, it was formed in the 1950s. It was formed to be in direct competition with the SAT, because again, this is a market share battle between these tests. And because historically, SAT always been more of a power test, more of an aptitude test, to compete against that, ACT's always been more of a curriculum-based test. So more in line with what students are day doing day in and day out, questions a little bit more straightforward, reading a little bit easier, which is why, in, especially in the Northeast, the ACT has the reputation of being, quote, an easier test but it's not easier per se. The difficulty on that ACT comes from the pace of it. It's an incredibly fast paced test. It's almost a total sprint from start to finish on that test. So students who take an ACT for the first time, often they'll walk out of there and be like, Drew, I didn't think it was that bad. I just wish I had another five or 10 minutes per section. If I had another five or 10 minutes per section, I really feel like I could have crushed it. But that's where the difficulty on that ACT comes from. Most students feel rushed. Most students feel like they don't have the time they need to really put their, um, hit their full potential on that test. So here's just a side-by-side -side comparison of them. You can see they're both pretty long. Three hours, 50 minutes on the SAT if students write that optional essay. Three hours, 35 minutes on that ACT, again, if students write that optional writing portion um, at the end. You can see there's a lot of overlap in terms of the content on this. Um, and for most students, I usually give them, when they see this slide, I usually give them roughly about 30 <laughs> seconds. It usually takes them about 30 seconds and they stare at this and they're like, Drew, I don't need to hear another word of what you're gonna tell me about the differences between the SAT and ACT. Uh, this is gonna be the easiest decision I have to make in this whole college admission process. I know exactly which test I'm taking and I'm taking the ACT. And the reason they come to that uh, conclusion is they look at that 65 minute reading section uh, on the SAT, that first section that they're gonna be asked to do, and they compare that to that 35 minute reading section on the ACT and they think to themselves, 65 minutes, 35 minutes, this is a no brainer. 
I'm going to take the 35-minute uh, reading section on that ACT. But here's the rub on that ACT. That 35-minute reading section, it's four passages. It's 40 questions. It's 35 minutes, which breaks down to eight and a half minutes per passage and 10 questions per each passage, which breaks down further to about four to four and a half minutes for students to read a pretty lengthy passage. And they can't just skim it. They actually have to read it for understanding. And that gives them four to four and a half minutes to answer 10 questions. And they got to keep that pace up for that full 35 minutes. Not an easy thing to do a total sprint from start to finish. The writing and language and the English, these are the, the two sections that are most similar to one another on this test. This is the grammar portion of the test. Students are given various passages with grammatical errors, and they're asked to correct those errors as they go. You can see on the SAT, there's a no calculator math section. Students, they're not trying to torment you by taking your calculator away. I'm as guilty as anyone on this. In today's day and age, I'm completely calculator dependent. What they're trying to do there is to test your math fluency. Do you actually understand the math behind the math, not just can you grab a calculator, put in numbers, find an answer, and really have no understanding of what you're doing? And then you get your calculator back for that second math section there, 55 minutes. ACT, again, a little bit more student friendly. Students are allowed their calculator throughout. But again, the difficulty comes from the pace of it. So it's 60 minutes, 60 questions. It's about one minute per question on that ACT math, which then brings us to the science section. I'm a little bit biased when I talk about this, so just keep this in mind from my background. It's not the science section on that ACT. It's not what's the chemical formula of photosynthesis. It's more deductive reasoning and logic. Can students using the scientific method uh, read and interpret scientific passages of which they might not know anything about that passage uh, and kind of build an understanding as they work through that passage in the questions? On the SAT, it's a little bit forced. They're trying to incorporate science throughout. So even though we're in a reading section or a grammar section, there might be these science-related questions. And according to the SAT, students are demonstrating their understanding of science if they can read a table. I might argue there might be a little bit more involved to science than just reading a table. But that's the way the SAT is trying to incorporate um, those, um, that science throughout that test. And then essay, I'll circle back to this. It is optional. Uh, at the end, we'll talk about the essay and kind of our recommendations as to whether or not students should write the essay or not. It's a total standalone score on that essay. It's not factored into the total score of the SAT or that composite score on that ACT. And then just in terms of the scoring, that SAT, it's back to 200, 800 on what they're calling evidence-based reading and writing, which is just a mouthful. I'm going to call that verbal and then 200 800 on the math. So it's back to that 400 to 1600 point scale that we all kind of grew up with and kind of knew and loved. And then ACT, it takes a little bit of getting used to if you're not used to that ACT scale. It's on a 1 through 36 scale. But what colleges care about is the overall composite score. And that overall composite score is just the average. So they're going to take the English math reading science scores, add them all up, divide by four. They do round up. So a 29 and a half is going to become a 30. Um, and that's how that ACT score is calculated. And just to, I'll throw, you'll see a, a concordance table uh, comparing the two scores a little bit later. But just to orient us, uh, an ACT score of 30 is the equivalent of about a 1370 on the, on the SAT. And now what we'll do is we'll just, we'll just do a quick side-by-side -side comparison of the questions um, on that SAT and ACT. Again, a lot of overlap in the content, but just so you can get a better sense in terms of how this power versus speed uh, plays out. So here's the grammar portion on, um, that, um, on the ACT. Uh, number nine, number eight there is just verb tense. Number nine is punctuation. Do students know the correct usage of a colon or a semicolon? I'm obviously, I'm not going to call on anybody to actually answer these. This is more just so you get a feel for it. The, um, the, the, the SAT questions, they look almost identical um, to this. Similarly, students are going to be given passages and asked to uh, correct grammatical errors as they go. This is what they call a data graphic question on the SAT. Again, this is the SAT kind of forcing science on this test. And again, the power component of this comes from, in addition to being able to read that table, students are going to be asked how this table actually supports that main argument that that author was trying to make. And I flipped through this a little bit quickly, but you kind of get a sense of this. The ACT, just the reading passages, a little bit easier language, a little bit more straightforward, more typical of what uh, a high school student might write, whereas on the SAT, these passages, just a little bit more academic language, a little bit harder reading uh, compared to that ACT. And then that SAT and ACT reading, in some ways we've already covered this. That SAT reading section, is, it's 65 minutes. It's five passages, so it's 13 minutes per passage. And again, that ACT, 
35 minutes, four passages, about eight and a half minutes per passage. And in the world of standardized testing, just a huge difference between having 13 minutes on a passage and eight and a half minutes on a passage. So just by knowing that, you can probably guess that SAT reading, it's gonna require a deeper reading, a closer reading, a more inferential reading, more questions along these lines, what can reasonably be inferred. And then for some of these questions, there's gonna be uh, some follow-up questions which uh, are worded like this, which choice provides the best evidence? And then there's gonna be actual line numbers in those answer choices there. Again, forcing students to do a close reading, a more analytical reading, almost a line by line reading of that passage. Whereas the ACT, they really just don't have time for that. More questions along these lines, the passage points to this. In that limited amount of time, can students show that they read and understood that central argument that that author was trying to make? Which then brings us to everybody's favorite topic, the math. And again, I'm not going to call on anyone here. These are both about slope of the line. And I'm just going to read that SAT question just so you can hear it, just so you can see kind of how a, what a power math question kind of looks like. So it goes like this. The graph of the linear function f has intercepts at a0 and 0, b in the xy plane. If a plus b equals 0 and a doesn't equal b, which of the following is true about the slope of the graph of f? And most students have the same reaction that we have when I read that, especially when I read it like that, which is, what? I have no idea what that is asking. It's actually not that bad a question. They could have worded this in a much more straightforward way, uh, in a much more accessible way. They could have worded this as the graph of the linear function f has intercepts at negative 2, 0 and 0, 2 in the xy plane. What is the slope of that line? And if they had worded it that way, most students would recognize it as being, oh, it's just asking me to find the slope of the line between two points. I know how to find the slope of the line uh, between two points. But in order for students to understand that this is really what that question is asking, they have to read and understand that whole if a plus b equals 0 and a doesn't equal b and figure out how that relates back to that earlier part of the question. So again, a little bit of misdirection here, trying to make this seem a little bit harder than it actually is. Whereas the ACT, generally speaking, they're, just, they're less interested in playing that game. Much more of a straightforward question. Students are given two lines. One of the slopes of that line is 3. They're asking for the, perpendic the slope of the perpendicular line. You either remember that perpendicular lines have negative reciprocal slopes or you don't. If you do remember it, you know the answer choice is C, negative one third. If you don't remember that, you're just you're choosing your favorite ACT letter and kind of moving on to that next question. There's nothing to kind of figure out here. There's no getting inside the test taker's head. You really can't kind of logic your way to that answer. Again, that difference between power versus speed on this. And then also just on the math, Huge focus on algebra on that SAT math. So 60 to 70% of the math on the SAT is algebra. So algebra 1 and algebra 2. Obviously, if they emphasize something, they need to de-emphasize something. What they de-emphasize was geometry. So geometry is less than 10% of the math on that um, SAT. Again, that no calculator section, not trying to torment students, but just testing their math fluency. Do they actually understand slope of the line? Do they actually know what they're finding when they find slope of the line? Whereas ACT, again, just broader, uh, more topics are covered, more geometry, more trig on that ACT compared uh, to that SAT. And again, a little bit more student-friendly calculators allowed uh, throughout. Which then brings us to the science section on that ACT. The science section, it's designed to take students' breaths away. Most students who encounter that SAT science, or ACT science section for the first time, they usually have the reaction of like, Drew, there's no way. There's no way that I'm going to be able to, um, to, to do 40 questions, uh, six or seven passages that have figures filled like, that look like this, and be able to get through that in 35 minutes. It's actually not that bad once students get some practice with it and get into it. I have no idea what an asthenosphere is. I have no idea what a lithosphere is. I don't need to know any of that, actually, in order to be able to, um, to solve this question. What I do need to be able to do is obviously read the question. So according to, to figure one, I have to be able to find figure one. It obviously has to be that, because it's the only thing on the slide. And to give you a sense of this, this is actually cut off. So the actual figure is about three times the length of this. It just didn't fit on the slide. But the, uh, the temperature of the outer core, so I know it's the outer core there, and I know how to read a graph. So I know I'm on the y-axis here in terms of the temperature. So I know I'm between these two dashed lines, and I know I'm between these two points. So I know that answer choice is C, 4,800 and 6,300. 
And this is where students struggle with the ACT. Because it's such a fast-paced test, and generally students are working at a pace that's faster than what they're comfortable with, the ACT just has the tendency to turn on uh, all students' self-doubt. And that voice of self-doubt goes something like this. Drew, you did that awfully quickly. Are you sure that answer choice is C? And if I give in to that voice, I'm going to double check this, or triple check this, or quadruple check this. And just on the ACT, they don't have time for that. So in addition to, in addition to giving students strategies and approach for this science section, it's also just trying to build their confidence that they can get a question like this, circle answer choice C, and without any hesitation or doubt, move on to that next uh, question. Which then brings us to the essay. So at this point, most students are feeling kind of like this. It gets even worse when they read that SAT essay prompt. So that SAT essay prompt, what it's going to ask students to do is students are going to be given, it's roughly a 600 to 700 word argument. And students aren't going to be asked whether they agree or disagree with the author's point of view, but rather what rhetorical devices did that author use and was she successful in the use of those devices. So you can just imagine if students have had no exposure to rhetorical analysis writing or have no idea that this prompt is coming, the College Board is just going to get thousands of essays that are like, yeah, I thought the author was convincing because before I read her argument, I wasn't convinced. And now I'm convinced. And then look at the clock and be like, oh my gosh, I have 40 more minutes. Like, What on earth am I going to write about for 40 minutes? It's actually not that bad. It's pretty formulaic. Uh, they're looking for um, things like the author's use of symbolic uh, language, like simile and metaphor, the author's use of exaggeration, the author's appeal to emotion, the author's citing an authority. For the rhetoric majors in the room, you might recognize that as Aristotle's triangle of rhetoric, like ethos and pathos. I always tell students, if you want to show off a little bit and use those terms, and you can use them correctly, by all means, go ahead and kind of sprinkle them throughout your essay. But don't feel obligated. You don't actually have to use those terms to score well on it. ACT, again, a little bit more student friendly, a little bit more straightforward of an essay prompt. Um, students are given, uh, usually it's a topic around something current event-ish, like should genetically modified foods be banned, yes or no. They are looking for the student's opinion on it. So yes, uh, and a clear thesis statement. So yes, uh, GMO foods should be banned, or no, they should not be banned. And then students are going to be given three different perspectives around that issue and asked to incorporate those perspectives throughout their essay. And again, I already mentioned this. It's optional. Right? It's not factored into the total score or composite score on that ACT. So should students actually you know, register, it does cost extra uh, to, to write the essay. We are down to, I think it's less than 20 schools now that require the essay. It's something a little bit under 30 schools that recommend. Generally, for our students, recommend means required. But just as the ultimate hedge, just being up here, not knowing what your lists are going to end up being, we recommend that students, when they register for these tests, that they write the essay at least once. And the reason for that is just even those schools, even the schools that require it or recommend it, they're not putting any weight on these essay scores, not really clear at all in terms of how they're using them. There are colleges out there that require it. And we just don't want our seniors, fall of senior year, to add a school to their list and realize they haven't taken these tests with the essay. And that school requires it or recommends it. And now possibly they're scrambling to take these tests one final time just for the sake of taking it with this essay again, even though not clear how colleges are going to use it. So that's where that recommendation comes from. It really is just kind of the ultimate hedge. Do it once. That way you know you have it. And that way, if you end up applying to a school that, for whatever reason, requires it or recommends it, um, you can send that essay score uh, to them. And then. You know, we've focused on sort of the differences uh, between that power versus speed on the SAT and ACT. There are some similarities between them, though. So the SAT has gone to four answer choices um, from five. Both tests have what they call rights-only scoring, which means there's no guessing penalty on either test. So if students just, they're reading an SAT question and they have no idea what it's asking, they should just choose their favorite SAT letter and bubble it in. Don't leave anything blank. And similarly on the ACT, if they run out of time on an ACT section again, choose your favorite ACT letter and bubble it all the way in. That writing test, almost identical um, on that SAT to the ACT English test. Both are more curriculum-based tests um, rather than aptitude tests. Again, a little bit forced on the SAT, but that incorporation of science. And again, similar skills, a lot of overlap in terms of the content that's covered between these two tests. But having gone through what we just went through, 
not the same. So generally, SAT, again, power test, more challenging questions, requires a deeper understanding of concepts, a narrower focus of skills, especially on the math with that focus on algebra, and again, more time per question, more of a power test. Whereas on that ACT, questions generally more straightforward, but it does require that instant recognition. Do students instantly recognize what that question is asking? Broader scope of skills, again, more math topics covered. But again, the difficulty comes from the pace of it. It's almost a total sprint from start to finish on that ACT, which then brings me to the million dollar question, which is, all right, Drew, so which test, right? Should we focus SAT? Should we focus ACT? And the reason why I put this cartoon up is just there's tons of urban legend out there that this type of student's going to prefer the SAT, this type of student's going to prefer the ACT. Really, at the end of the day, the best way to determine whether to go down an SAT or an ACT path is to try both tests, ideally in a practice setting. Again, you can use the PSAT as that baseline score and as, um, as the student's experience for sitting for an SAT. Uh, and again, this is where I encourage you, if you have the time and can do it, Take advantage of the, of the free proctored practice test that we offer if students want to just try out an ACT without the pressure of registering for the one in February and actually sitting for an official test. You'll get, you'll get that score back and you, you'll also have a comparable experience on this. So keep in mind, 70 to 80% of students score equally well on both tests, which is not that surprising. They're supposed to be college admissions tests. You would hope that, they, that students would score similarly on them. So often, whether or not to go down an SAT path or an ACT path, we always tell students, don't overthink this. Just kind of trust your gut instinct a little bit. We joke, which one did you hate the least? Which one do you think plays to your strengths? If you're going to do some prep for it, which one, uh, which one would you rather prep for? Because Almost all students, regardless of whether they go down an SAT or an ACT path, they're going to end up at the same point. They're going to end up with very, very similar scores. Again, it's just trying to take some of the pressure off students. Which one did they kind of prefer? Obviously, if statistically speaking, students have a scoring preference for one or the other, that's generally the way we'll lean in terms of making that um, recommendation. So here's the concordance table. I know it's a little bit small. You have a copy of it in the college admission testing guide. Uh, and again, just to orient us, so 24 on the ACT, that's Massachusetts state average, which is why I choose that. That's the equivalent of an 1180 on that SAT. And again, that 30 on the ACT is the equivalent of that 1370 on um, that SAT. So just real quickly in terms of subject tests. Uh, so most of us knew them maybe at one point as achievement tests. They've also been called SAT2s. The college boards finally decided on just calling them subject tests. These are just hour long content area tests. They're all multiple choice. These tests have not been redesigned, so there's five answer choices on them. There is still a guessing penalty on it, so students, if you end up taking a subject test, don't randomly guess on it. If you don't know what a question's asking, we generally recommend that you skip it. Again, we're down to a very, very small list of schools that are recommending or requiring it. And then it's just, again, they're hour-long content ones. Generally, our recommendation for subject tests, you want to take them when that academic course is ending. Also, just be aware, for those colleges that require or recommend subject tests, they will not take AP scores in lieu of those subject test scores, which is always a little bit frustrating and annoying for students to hear. But think about it in terms of just killing two birds with one stone. So if you're an AP course and you're doing well in it, all that work that you're doing to prep for an AP test, it's going to help on that subject test. But just to, you might consider putting that as part of your testing plan, thinking about taking, for instance, that bio subject test if you're in AP, if you're in AP bio. For the colleges that require it or recommend it, they're only looking for two subject tests. Obviously, if you take more and do well on it, you can go ahead and send them. Um, the one exception is Georgetown. So Georgetown strongly recommends subject tests. They still want three. They're the last holdout. And with the exception of, of engineering programs or some specific majors, uh, which might want to see a math, either math one or math two in a science, colleges aren't going to care which subject tests you end up sending. But here's the list. So here's the, here's the colleges. There's only three of them that require subject tests from all applicants. It's California Institute of Technology, Harvey Mudd, and MIT. Here's the list of schools that recommend. And generally, again, this language is always frustrating for everybody. We usually read recommend as required, but this is where you find like the Dukes of the world and the Harvards of the world and the Yales of the world. But the vast, vast, vast majority of students, they're not going to have to put subject tests on their radar. They're not going to have subject tests as part of that testing plan. But just to make you aware, if you're looking at these, uh, these most selective schools, you might want to just uh, think about subject tests and make sure uh, that you have them as part of your plan. I mean, kind of goes without saying, 
But you can't take the SAT and subject tests on the same day. Not that you would want to. It could be like seven hours of testing. So if you're thinking about doing, for instance, like the May SAT, and you're thinking about taking subject tests, you're probably going to be targeting June for those, uh, for those subject um, tests. And again, back to there are some colleges out there, especially for engineering programs or other majors, uh, which might require uh, or recommend subject tests. And again, colleges, are, they try to be upfront in terms of their policies. These policies are ever changing. Generally, you can either go on their website or you can call them uh, to get a sense in terms of whether they're requiring or recommending uh, those um, subject tests. Which then brings us back, brings us to kind of when should I be taking them? So I've always, I've already kind of mentioned again, late spring, junior year, fall of senior year is when students, statistically speaking, are going to hit their best scores. But here are kind of the options, especially for the juniors in the room as we as we kind of ramp up into standardized testing season. So you can see we have a February ACT coming up. So students can do a February ACT, then a March SAT, then an April ACT, then a May SAT, and we've come this far. There's a June SAT and a June ACT, and hey, there's summer testing now. That's fantastic. There's a July ACT and August SAT, and then fall of senior year, kind of rinse, lather, repeat. Please, please, please don't do that. No one wants students taking these tests six, seven, eight, nine times. Generally speaking, students aren't one and done on this just because they're always a little bit nervous the first time uh, they take it. But most students are going to hit their, their peak scores or scores that are more reflective of their potential after taking it two or three times. Depending on when students start, sometimes we'll have students who end up taking it four times. They might add uh, you know, a fourth test maybe in fall of senior year. But anything beyond that, you really start uh, running into the law of diminishing returns. These scores, they do plateau. It does just kind of build frustration on everybody's part. So generally speaking, two or three times, maybe four at the absolute most, depending on when you start, is, uh, is, is a good number for students to take. And you know, just to kind of give you a sense in terms of the world that we live in now, the ACT, they actually had to start limiting uh, the number of tests uh, that students can take. Uh, they had a student who tried to register for her 14th ACT test, and uh, the ACT decided that that was enough and cut her off. How they came up with 13 was an okay number, but 14 was just totally over the top. I don't know, but again, generally speaking, two, three, or, or four uh, times. And then also, again, I know I've said this ad nauseum, but I just want to fight back a little bit on that early and often testing because I know there's huge pressures out there for just keep testing, 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 and start earlier and earlier and earlier. But generally speaking, students, again, uh, they're going to hit those, those scores kind of late spring of junior year, fall of um, senior year. So here's just, again, there's always exceptions to this, but this is just kind of our general guidelines as you're thinking about sort of junior year testing. So for the sophomores in the room, Again, Emily already kind of mentioned this, but it's too early to be thinking about this now, right? Don't start prep now unless, you know, there's a couple exceptions to it, like recruited athletes, coaches want scores earlier and earlier and earlier. Uh, there might be some exceptions as to why we would start, but generally speaking, focus on academics, extracurricular, right? Really trying to have students explore their, their passion and figuring out what they like. Uh, and not worrying about the whole standardized testing and, and, and adding that component to it. Uh, you know, at the end of sophomore year, uh, over the summer, if students you know want to do it, uh, just as an, a little bit of an upfront investment, if they want to come in and you know try a full length SAT or ACT, so we can at least start the planning process. Doesn't mean we're going to start prep over the summer because again, too early for that. Um, but it uh, it can it can give us a chance to just kind of compare scores and, and try to map out whether or not we're going to do that SAT or ACT. So SAT kind of a typical plan for us, sort of March May um, for students taking it twice in junior year, uh, with June for subject tests if they need it, and then knowing they have that fall of senior year as needed. And then ACT, similarly, there's February, April, June. We usually tell students to try to pick two uh, of those dates, whatever's going to work best, and again, fall of senior year um, as needed. And then the other just kind of general guideline on this, the tests are accepted equally by colleges, right? So if we can kind of make that decision as to whether or not we're going towards an SAT or an ACT, think about it in terms of taking the potential amount of prep work or amount of work students might do and cutting it in half, right? So the other thing we're trying to avoid is we're trying to avoid flip-flopping or ping-ponging between the two tests, so going February ACT to March SAT, back to April ACT to May SAT. It's just efficiency, right? There's a lot of overlap in the content. Any work that students do for one is going to certainly help with that other test. 
but we're trying to, again, we're trying to keep this sensible um, and trying to, you know, sort of half the amount of work that those students uh, are going to end up doing on this, knowing perfectly well any work that students do, if, for instance, at the end of junior year, if they're just kind of, if they went an SAT path and they just kind of felt like their scores have plateaued and aren't really reflective of who they are, and they want to switch to that ACT, it's not like they're starting from square one. It's not like all that work that they did on the SAT. It's going to help them on that ACT um, as, um, as well. So just for the visual learners in the room, this is what it looks like, right? These are all the potential tests starting in the spring of sophomore year that students can take. And we're trying to get that down to something reasonable and something sensible. So here's just, you know, here's a, here's just a sample one just to give you a feel for it. And again, for juniors in the room, you know, you're not behind in any way, shape, or form. You got the PSAT scores back. If you felt good about the PSAT and just want to go down an SAT path, I'm 100% comfortable with that. But again, if you want to try out an ACT, um, still there's time to do that. Um, so you can decide whether you're going to go SAT or ACT. But this student did the Diags in August after uh, sophomore year. Scored equally well on both, kind of had a preference for the SAT, so we went down an SAT path. Obviously, you can see did the PSAT in October. Uh, and then we did March and May uh, for the SAT. Student was in some AP courses and was also looking at some of those uh, most competitive or most selective schools. So we had subject tests just being on their radar uh, for June. And then students just felt pretty common, actually, that they didn't maximize their score uh, and just wanted to try that SAT one more time. So took it in August uh, right before that senior uh, year. And again, this is just a sample plan. At the end of the day, um, that testing plan that works best for you, that is the one that we should uh, go for. No right or wrong way uh, to do this. And then just real quickly to wrap up, I do just want to cover score choice and super scoring quickly on this. So almost all schools honor what they call score choice. So what score choice means is you're in charge of your scores. Uh, you decide whether or not you're going to send those scores on to colleges. There is a very, very small number of colleges that require all scores. It's something like greater than 95% of colleges honor score choice. A small number that do not, you can see the list here. Uh, not entirely clear why schools want to see all scores. It's partly they're trying to get ahead of that early and often testing, right? So if a student's like, you know what, Drew, I don't care. I'm going to take these things 10 times, and I'm going to take each test 10 times, and I'm just going to brute force my way to, through this process. By knowing that they have to send all scores, hopefully it's just going to slow that roll down a little bit and hopefully encourage the student to come up with something a little bit more sensible. The other reason why, um, uh, some, uh, why colleges want to see all scores is it's because they're, in fact, super scoring. So what super scoring means is if a student's taken the test more than once, they have to send the full score report um, that has all the subsection scores from those testing dates. But what schools are going to do is they're going to cherry pick the highest subsection scores from those different administrations of the test and build what I call sort of a Frankenstein score. So in this case, this student ended up submitting May uh, and August, or potentially March, May, and August. And the schools that super score, what they're going to do, they're going to cherry pick that 650 from May and pair it with that 640 uh, verbal from August. And back in my day, it was a folder, but they're going to write the student's SAT scores as 650, 640, uh, 1290. Again, colleges that are super scoring, they're not playing gotcha here. They're not looking at that 580 and that comparing that to the 640 and averaging them and trying to figure out, OK, or which one's the real score. They're going to take those highest subsection scores, and they're going um, to give that student credit for that highest uh, subsection scores. A couple of reasons why colleges are doing this. One is my favorite joke around this. They're called college admissions officers, not college rejection officers. They're reading every applicant in the best light. They're trying to read the application as supportively as possible. So looking at super scores, it's a better indication of that student's full potential and actual potential and actual kind of um, score on these tests. The other reason why schools are super scoring, we all kind of loathe the US News and World Report rankings. But standardized testing, even though it's getting de-emphasized, it's still part of those rankings. And even things like you wouldn't even think of, like a college's bond rating, can be impacted by their published SAT and ACT scores. So it is in the college's best interest to be able to report as high SAT and ACT scores as they can. And super scoring is a way by which um, they can do that. It's something over like 93% of colleges super score the SAT 
SAT. Almost all colleges superscore the SAT. An increasing percentage are, are superscoring the ACT now um, as well. Uh, not quite uh, the same percentage as the SAT. I think we're certainly over 60%. We might be approaching 70% of, of colleges that are superscoring the ACT. And that superscoring looks the same. So this student, again, took February, June, and September. Their highest composite score was from June with that 30. And then schools that super score again. They're going to cherry pick those, highest, those four highest subsection scores, 32, 30, 33, 30. Recalculate that composite. You can see it here. And in that student's folder, again, even though they didn't get it in a single sitting, that student's ACT score is going to be considered in red as um, a 31. The other reason why I want to mention super scoring is, again, just so you're aware that more and more colleges are doing this, it's also, I totally get this. The PSAT scores just came back. It's in everybody's kind of instinct, right? You see the PSAT score, and then you just, you, you know, you might have a list, especially for juniors, of colleges that you might be thinking about, and you look at the PSAT score, and then you look at the published SAT scores from those colleges that you might be interested in. And you might realize your PSAT score might be a little bit lower than what those colleges are looking for or what they're accepting. And again, you start hitting the panic button a little bit. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, do we need to rethink the list? Do we need to start you know, prepping five days a week in order to get that score up? So the only thing I caution you on is just keep in mind that published SAT or ACT score, generally speaking, it's going to be a super score, right? So you are comparing a score from admitted uh, seniors who have probably taken this test two, three, maybe four times, and it's that super score that they're reporting. And you're comparing that to a PSAT score where the student hopefully went in and just took it completely cold, right? Really no idea what, was, what that test, what may have even been on it. And now you're comparing that PSAT score from October of junior year to that super score published scores from the colleges. So again, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Again, please don't hit that panic button if that PSAT score came in a little bit uh, lower uh, than what you were hoping it would come in at. And then just real quickly, in terms of just some guiding principles on prep uh, for these tests. Generally speaking, we want any kind of prep to lead up to an actual test. It's like anything. As students are peaking in practice, it's when we want them to go in uh, and take it. And depending on student starting score and their goal, you're generally looking at anywhere between like six weeks and 15 weeks um, of, of some practice uh, leading up to that test date. And three major areas go into test prep. So one is content, just knowing what's on the test. Uh, the other is strategy, just having a game plan for every question and every section. And then that best form of practice is practice, practice, practice on official retired tests. So the College Board, they've partnered with Khan Academy. They've now released, I think it's eight, it might even be nine now, uh, official practice tests uh, that students can take. They have the, the, scaled, uh, the scales for those tests. They also have, obviously, right and wrong answers. They also have explanations, and the explanations are aren't bad. Uh, ACT has something similar. It's the official guide to the ACT. It's the Red Book. There's four um, tests in there, but you can also go online. There's another three or four or five um, online tests that you can find, again, official tests um, that have been retired. And again, for students in the room, it's not just brute force, like, oh my gosh, I'm taking the SAT in two weeks. I got nine practice tests. Here we go. I'm going to do all nine. Yay, my score went up. Boo, my score went down. Yay, it went back up. But it's really having the discipline to go back in and looking at those questions that you missed and not only understanding, obviously, why the wrong answer was the wrong answer and why the right answer was the right answer, but understanding why you chose that wrong answer, what led you to that wrong answer. That's what's going to help you uh, raise that score because you are going to see similar types of questions on those uh, on those. Um, on the actual tests. And again, I know I've hit you with a lot in a relatively short amount of time, but just to kind of sum up what we talked about tonight, again, most students are going to score the same, regardless of whether they go SAT or ACT. But sometimes it can be worthwhile, a little bit of an upfront investment um, to, to figure out if a student has a scoring preference or just a general preference for one or the other. And again, because there is so much overlap in content, prepping for one does help for the other. And then again, I know I've said this many times, but I'll say it one more time. Right, just most students are going to hit their best scores late spring of junior year, fall of senior year, because performance on these tests, as they're more curriculum-based tests, uh, they do correlate with age, maturity, and time spent in school. And then I just leave you on this note, right, that a good testing plan, it just has to prioritize school work over any kind of test prep. We know the number one thing that colleges are looking at is that transcript, is students day in and day out uh, performance in school. So it doesn't do us any good to raise standardized testing scores if it's at the expense of day in and day out academics. And I know it's easy for me to say up here, 
But really, at the end of the day, again, it is just a test, right? It is not the be-all, end-all of this process. They do look at many, 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 many factors um, as, as, as they're evaluating um, applicants. So for those of you going through this for the first time, I just encourage you, try to have some fun with this if you can. Think about it as being like the ultimate family bonding experience. Like when else are you going to go on a 14-hour road trip with potentially the entire family? If there's younger siblings, you have to throw them in the car too, right? At some point, you're going to lose cell phone service, so you get to talk to one another. So that's kind of exciting. Because again, like really at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you know, there's something like 1,800 colleges and universities out there. You're trying to narrow that down to a reasonable number of colleges to apply to, knowing that your student's going to thrive academically, socially, extracurricularly at any one of those that they end up getting, uh, that they end up getting uh, into. And then just real quickly, in terms of who we are. So again, I'm with Summit. Our, our office is in Newton, uh, but again, we do offer practice tests twice a month out here on the North Shore. But if for whatever reason that, that's not going to work, uh, hopefully, again, traffic's not too terrible on weekends. So please, again, I encourage you, uh, call us up, let us know. Uh, please take advantage of those. They do fill, but generally, if you give us a week or two weeks uh, advance notice, uh, we should no problem be able to get you in for one of those practice tests. All right, thanks everybody for hanging in there. I know it was a lot of info in a relatively short amount of time, but I hope it was helpful. Q&A, and I'm only standing here because if I don't repeat the question, then the audience at home can't hear. So you can either um, repeat the question if we have any, or sure. I can pass the mic around. Yep. Yeah, no, go ahead, you. Uh, uh, question about the subject test. Yep. Yeah, so in terms of whether, so the question is, you know, um, around subject tests, like, should you just go ahead and take subject tests as well in addition to the SAT? Or ACT. Or ACT. ACT. Yeah, so, so it's kind of, the history of the, those subject tests is there used to be way more colleges that required subject tests, and many of those colleges would accept the ACT in lieu of those subject tests. So if student ended up submitting an ACT score, they actually didn't need subject tests. But those schools that are on that list that you saw that either require or recommend, they want to see subject tests. So they will not take an ACT score in lieu of those subject tests. So if you go down an ACT path, you're still going to need those subject tests for those, for those schools. But thanks for asking that. Because yeah, it was a very different answer three or four years ago than, than that current one, than where we are now. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Oh, thanks. sure. Um, if, this, if it turns out that the student can qualify for like the 50% time accommodation yep. or something like that, yep. how does your, your test prep um, and your practice test um, work for that? Yeah, so, so the question is just around uh, accommodations and extended time. And I'll just back it up a little bit. So both organizations, they do offer these tests with accommodations. So if students have a 504 or are on an IEP and are using those accommodations in school, they'll also qualify uh, or potentially get permission to use those accommodations on these tests. The, the most standard uh, or the most common accommodation is 50% uh, extended time. Uh, and for both the SAT and for the AT, ACT. Just keep in mind, and again, I'll try to answer your question more directly in a minute, but just keep in mind, they're totally separate organizations. So they have two very uh, different um, processes in terms of getting those accommodations. So just because you have it for the SAT, the school may have just gotten it for you without you really having to do anything or any knowledge that they were applying for you. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have it from the ACT. You have to apply to the ACT separately to get that accommodation. Um, and then to answer your question, so we do for our practice tests, we do offer the extended time accommodation. So if students have uh, extended time, that 50%, and want to come into our office and take it with um, that extended time, uh, we do have spots for that. They do fill it just because it's a little bit limited. So that extended time, it is a little bit of a double-edged sword uh, because these four-hour tests are going to become seven-hour tests with that time and a half. But again, what they're trying to do there is just level the playing field a little bit because for those students who need extended time, taking these tests regular time, there is no way that that score is going to be reflective or any indication of kind of what they're capable of on this test. So that's why, uh, that's why both organizations uh, give those accommodations. But there is a process in terms of 
getting, uh, getting those. And again, you'll work closely with the school because there's paperwork that the school needs to submit uh, and they'll help you and guide you through that process also. I would just add to that, if anyone is considering your sons or daughters or students who are out there who might need extended time, um, that's something you can follow up with directly with your counselor about and we can point you in the right direction and help you navigate that. I will just want to mention too before I forget that we do host the May administration of the SAT. That's the only test administration that we offer outside of the PSAT here. So many of our junior students will take that test here and in terms of numbers, we also recommend registering for that test through College Board um, as soon as possible because we are a small school, our space fills up quickly, and so our students want to have the opportunity to take it um, in their home, if you will, and not have to go to another area school. So that's it's a nice environment to take it, especially for the first time, um, just kind of being familiar with the school and the test examiners are largely faculty. So um, again, that is not something that the guidance department manages. Like Drew was mentioning, they're completely separate organizations, so registration happens entirely through either College Board or ACT. And then also keep in mind, you're going to have to register for these tests. So the school yep. registers you for the PSAT, but they're not registering Correct. you for either SAT or ACT. Yep. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Yep. What's the turnaround time when you take the test? So, so if you're taking a fall set test, are you going to be able to get your score back first? Yeah. So the question is, is turnaround time in terms of these tests? So for both the SAT and the ACT, they try to turn the official tests around in about two to three weeks. So for, for seniors of, um, so for seniors in terms of keeping a, an eye on that um, early decision deadline, which is usually November 1. So on the SAT, obviously that August, you get those scores back in plenty of time. The October test date, you get back in time. Uh, similarly on the ACT July, obviously, September, obviously. That October date on that, um, on that ACT, it's the end of October. So you're not going to have those scores back in terms of November 1, but it all depends on the Colleges. There are some colleges out there that will take what they call a score pending, which means you told you know you just don't have the scores yet, but you took it. There are other colleges out there in terms of that early decision deadline where they need everything on file by that November one for your application to be uh, considered complete. But yes, definitely, if you're thinking about fall testing and senior year, something to keep an eye on in terms of those deadlines. No other questions? We'll, we'll linger for a few minutes and, and answer any individual questions. Um, and then just, again, a friendly reminder, Junior Parent Night is coming up on the 24th of January. And um, we will definitely send out email reminders about our Sophomore Parent Night because that's coming up soon. But I, I cannot remember it right off the top of my head. I'm sorry. It's a little bit of a brain delay. But I will make sure that we send out communication about the Sophomore Parent Night as well. So All right, great. thanks again, Drew. All right. Thanks, really everybody. It.